<laughs> well, <clears throat> hello everybody and welcome to the second half of Saturday here at the um, OpenSim Community Conference. Uh, my name is Mal Burns and this is actually going to be the first of, sort of two slightly related uh, lunchtime um, discussions, as it were. And um, our, our theme uh, for this one, at least, is to look looking at the new open source and interoperability. Uh, this is something that sort of really emerged recently. Um, I know all of you, well, maybe you don't, but uh, maybe you're in, sort of still in shock over the behavior of Mark Zuckerberg. But um, the metaverse, whatever it now is, <laughs> has been very much in focus. And um, it seems that every corporate body or game body under the sun is apparently building their own metaverse. The implication being that there are t now, <laughs> it's now plural. Um, uh, Charlie Fink put it rather well when he said, well, there's small M's, lots of them, but there's only one big M. <laughs> uh, personally speaking, I now refer to everything as cyberspace again. It was a, it, basically, you can't put the word the in front of it, so nobody can sort of take possession of the cyberspace or anything. It simply is. And I think that has been the problem uh, with the latest attempts to define the metaverse and everything, because it, we, we make a noun out of it, and therefore it needs a descriptor. Anyway, this is sort of just anecdotal here. Uh, what, of course, is um, quite vital is that in this growing expansion of the um, cyberverse, whatever you want to call it, is that open soon, well, rather, sorry, open source remains strong. Um, this has been the case with the web and all sorts of things online going back when. You have the commercial players, often, who really just hijack a lot of open source stuff that's been done already. I must say there's some of that going on at the moment. But um, we really feel, and I'm, I'm sure everybody who's at this conference, um, although our concern is largely with OpenSim at the moment, um, looking beyond the platform we've got here, the model that this platform represents is, uh, you know, as an open platform and, um, uh, well, just as basically being an open platform, it's this model that uh, we want to hang on to. And in many ways, I also think that whilst people are saying, oh, it looks primitive and it's like second life and blah, 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 I think that OpenSim in many ways is a, a great template for the future metaverse or whatever is going to be called you know we have interconnectability where you know we can jump between regions uh, simulators with the hypergrid uh we can communicate across the hypergrid we can um we can have asset servers and you know serving our avatar and other assets literally on our own computer and just jump in online to wherever we want to go and sure on the surface it looks a bit second lifey and whatever maybe looks a bit dated but the power the potential under there um in the open code is is still some, um you know a landmark shall we say anyway uh one of the one of the major um uh, they, they have a discord channel we'll get to that in a minute um one of the major concerns um seeking um to look at the new open source is an organization called omi omi uh, open metaverse initiative yeah they've got the n word i know but never mind and um they they've been holding um oh a lot of meetings recently and they've got lots of different working groups working on different areas none of them are specific to open sim of course but they are kind of aligned uh to what we what we do um one of the other people who's been present at these um, meetings, so to speak, um, is Adam Frisbee, who you all know is a co-creator or founder of OpenSim here. And um, of course, he's behind, um, uh, well, Science Space and Break Room. That's the one. <laughs> Get it right. Um, and uh, But he's been turning up there with a, 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 what I can see is a considerable interest in the, you know, the the, the movement, if for want of a better word. Um, in Kenzo, otherwise known as Eva Henning, is here because she really is the, well, the principal spokesman, or spokeswoman, I should say, um, for um, e um, <laughs> Evo, sorry, Omi. Yeah. 
all, all these yeah. short letter things um, itself. And finally, we're also joined by Dale Glass, who is uh, really a principal operator um, over at Vicadia. Now, we, we had a panel which included Vicadia last year. Um, Vicadia is also, to a great extent, open source. Um, its particular code base is built on um, Philip Rosedale's High Fidelity, the, when it was a 3D world. Um, almost everything is set voice, I think, in High Fidelity got open source. So Vicadia um, have been pursuing that. There, there's a couple of other people using High Fidelity is code, but they're not necessarily open source in the same way. So I'd like you to welcome you all here. So welcome, Eva. Or oh, I can't call you in. <laughs> you can call right. me Eva. That's totally fine. And yeah. I, I apologize. I wasn't expecting to be using this username here. Uh, yeah. So I had a little bit of dysphoria. We talked about that earlier, but uh, it's great to be here with you today. This is um, I have not been in any of these open sim worlds in open simulator or in uh, any of these spaces for a number of years. So it's really great to come back and, and explore here. And uh, Mal, thank you for that intro. I, I sit as one of the three co-chairs at Open Metaverse Interoperability, which is a, a community group with the W3C. And, and we're really focused on the connecting tissue between all of these vast worlds, and we think of the these these galaxies and and how they all fit together, and and sort of thinking about the vastness of the metaverse as many different ways of being, many different ways of working together, many different realities, and and different visions of what that can be. Uh, and so we're excited to be here with you and to share some of the work we've been working on in. Uh, open source R and D uh, for another metaverse. I'd say wonderful. Well, it's wonderful to have you. And I must say, I mean, over and beyond your meetings, I mean, I keep finding you all over the place. You know, sort of, you may not have been in here, but you've been in an awful lot of other worlds and um, different things uh, talking online recently. So, uh, yes. Um, and it's funny. Yeah, I feel like I know you as Evo now, even though, you know, in Kenzo, I definitely knew in the old days, but. It's almost you're like you're a different person now, but never mind that. Never mind that. And, and um, lots of conversations we have here. We are, we so, are different uh, beings and avatars in these different realities. So it, it's great to be here with you today. Um, yeah. Okay, your voice was cutting out slightly there. I hope we don't have a problem. Okay, um, I'm going to move across to um, let Adam introduce himself, I think. Adam, welcome. Thank you for having me. I think I've been here to, to a, a regular, regular um, staple at, at these events for the last couple of years. It's nice oh, to yeah. be back. And I think that it's interesting to see how open source and the open source philosophy um, could shape the future of, of virtual worlds in general. I think Omi has some in interesting ideas. Um, I think that there's there's still quite a few problems that, that need to be resolved if you want this to, to be successful. So I'm really happy to sort of elaborate on that uh, as we, we get into the discussion. Okay, fair enough. Um, now, I'm not, I, I, I'm very at my depth with you because you're a, a particularly techie. I mean, as well as being a CTO, you, <laughs> you know all this code stuff. And I think, well, what are they talking about there? Their GT, FEs and whatever. But yes, <laughs> I, I will come to that shortly. Finally, I'm going to welcome Dale Glass. So Dale, I've already introduced you as being a primary mover over at Vicadia. Maybe you'd like to elaborate a little bit more there, especially about the open source aspect. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Uh, yeah, I'm a bit new at this, and uh, I've not actually done very much related to OpenSIM in quite a while. Uh, so yeah, my first time at this conference, but yeah, thank you. Right, so let's see. Uh, well, you probably already know we are a fork of the now dead high fidelity, uh, not the one that exists currently, but the previous one, which is confusing. Um, so yeah, we picked it up a couple of years ago and uh, still working on improving it and maintaining it and uh, trying to uh, turn it uh, into a better platform. I, back when I found it, I thought it was, and it had an amazing potential and uh, it, was, it was a real pity that it actually died shortly after I found it. So 
uh, decided well that could that couldn't be allowed to stand and well if there were other people that were going to uh, work on it I will definitely join them and yeah try to uh, keep uh, things moving and so here I am wonderful well I've got fond memories of hyperdose the 3d world <laughs> as well <laughs> Um, it was another one that showed a lot of potential. And I, I almost regret that Philip sort of took it down when he did. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, he's got very confirmed change of opinion these days. But, um, you know, I keep wondering if it had still been going when COVID came along and we were being forced into online, you know, presence and whatever, whether <laughs> it would have maybe stood a better chance. Oh, well, um, yeah, it was, it was terrible timing, really. Yes, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> That's sod's law, as they say in England here. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Um, now, before I move on, um, and none of you would actually be privy to this, but just uh, just before this thing, there was a, a private uh, Q&A with the developers in a, a, an adjacent region here. And um, it was getting quite volatile when we had to stop it. Um, basically, um, a lot of people were criticising um, OpenSIM uh, for um, not having good documentation, or if indeed any, <laughs> and, um, you know, get, having that feel of being, you know, a, a bit antiquated, and more importantly, um, security concerns, um, uh, which um, the technical side of which, again, I have no idea. But obviously, they were finding sort of holes in it that made it very awkward to present to, say, the enterprise or companies. Um, possibly those kind of holes as things that all the you know consumer interfacing world should also consider um but given that uh, what you've all been talking about and doing i'd like to actually address each of you in both your three worlds so to speak um are, um how can i put this is there a conscientious effort um say at omi to actually catalog all these codes and the different strands that are emerging out of that kind of collective um so that as things progress one can actually move back on that and um to uh, dale and adam too you know do you really think is that something we should consider to be very important i'll start with either uh, I'm happy to speak to what we've been doing to connect what uh, Neil Trevitt at Kronos Group calls the constellation of standards that touch yeah. the open metaverse. Um, so that includes things like WebXR and all of the open web experiences that we are beginning to see uh, bloom in a, in a hundred different directions. Um, that includes uh, the GLTF spec and looking at the evolution of programmable 3D assets and how those can be uh, embedded with uh, much more information than what we have done previously with simple models and um, and exchangeable assets. So we're we're often thinking about interoperability, and I want to take a quick step back here because we're thinking about oh. interoperability to include uh, asset exchange identity and avatar ability to move between worlds. Um, and so sometimes that's referred to as meta traversal. Uh, and, and that includes a number of these different elements, right? Can you take your identity? Can you take your inventory? Can you uh, secure your data when you make that transition? Um, so not just the addressability of a 3D world and moving from 2D to 3D in the way that the web is moving, um, but also, how do we exchange metadata between one world to the next? So um, there's a lot of conversation happening between uh, game platforms, between the open standard groups, W3C, IEEE, Kronos Group, and, and others. And, and I'd love for Adam and, and Dale here to speak more to how they've been uh, helping to guide that, that process along the way. Okay, Adam. It's like musical chairs here, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. Well, look, I think the, the original question is on the the historical elements and obviously learning from, from past mistakes is important. I think one of the things we need to recognize in this industry is that we should be informed by the past by not bound to it. And by that I mean is that there's a lot of ways that virtual worlds work today, uh, the most successful ones, but it's the same way they've been working for 20 something years. And, and I think that there's some there's some evolutions of ideas that, that need to be considered as we build these things. 
Um, but ultimately, yes, I do think that uh, there should be an effort towards cataloging a lot of the old worlds and what they did right and what they did wrong. One of the things that I have been blessed by uh, is the fact that I've been in this industry for, for now about 25 years. And during that time, I've had the opportunity to, to learn a lot of a lot of mistakes. Uh, and one of the things that we see, particularly with new virtual worlds, um, including from the biggest companies, uh, Facebook's previous couple of virtual worlds spring to mind, where people are making the same mistakes that lots of early virtual worlds made uh, and really running into things that uh, could have been avoided with a, a five minute Google search on why did product X not succeed? That said, um, I think that in terms of the larger conversation we're having today, I think that the the idea of actually having open standards and open interoperable working groups between people is very important. There's really only so many parts of a virtual world that fit together. Uh, when you bring things down to the sort of base levels, there's actually only about four or five different things that actually need to be standardized to build an open virtual world. You need to have content delivery standards. You need to have um, session uh, protocol standards. So the ability to sort of distribute a scene graph and and make sure that that's upgraded and uh, sorry um, uploaded to all the, the clients consistently. And you need to worry about a couple of things like asset delivery handling and inventory and things like that. But ultimately, there's not that many bits to bits and pieces. So actually working towards an open standard is quite achievable and is something I think can happen, but obviously requires a lot of buy in from a, from a lot of players. Yeah, I think when Eva mentioned that one of the last meetings, uh, they, they were getting it about um, a sort of collaborative interest in the Kronos group. I think that was was, was very significant too, because um, they are um, they're probably the the name that I think of most when it comes to you know the the, the high end uh, sort of industry um, uh, involvement as it were. Uh, Dale, your thoughts on all this? Uh, well, uh, so let's let let's let's see. Uh, first of all. Um, Kind of a bit of a disclaimer, I suppose. Uh, not sure if uh, there's much of awareness of how we work, uh, but we're not a company. The KDI is pretty much a volunteer group made entirely of volunteers, and so even being um, at least theoretically, I mean, on the top of it, I don't really have the capability of giving orders to anybody. Like I can, of course, ask for a favor or something. But I'm very careful with such things because, well, uh, we're uh, nobody is an employee, including including yeah. uh, people, uh, members of the core group, right? So for that reason, we are not going to make any kind of binding promise regarding which is our official direction or what not. Like the, there certainly is, uh, people with interest in various things, but we don't force anyone to work on anything. And it's basically, uh, in the end, uh, up to somebody being personally interested in picking something up. Sure. Uh, uh, right. But uh, yeah, definitely, there is some interest in standardization and inter interoperability and compatibility. Yeah, we use GLTF, for instance. So yeah, that's uh, one area of interest. We use common codecs. Uh, we've actually implemented support for the Opus codec. Uh, in Vercadia, which is something High Fidelity didn't have. Uh, High Fidelity actually has something of its own, which is uh, proprietary and not compatible with anything else. Uh -huh. uh, it, it has interesting characteristics, but yeah, it's closed source, so not good for us. Uh, we've also looked, uh, and a member of the community also looked into the underlying protocol for Vercadia, well, High Fidelity, uh, what it was. Uh, it's based on something called UDT, which is a standard and does have an implementation, a standard implementation, uh, but our actual implementation is not entirely standard. So yes, so there is uh, that that one issue. With uh, one of the things that we uh, probably have to do at some point is um, bringing ourselves into compliance with the actual standard. But uh, since we're actually kind of um, not properly implementing the, the existing standard, uh, but at least it's not uh, our uh, a completely novel invention. So the possibility of uh, bringing things into compliance is a possibility. Uh, right, so uh, 
on matters like OpenSea, well, I think uh, there's not much hope of uh, very much exchange except for things like models, textures, and so on, because it's a completely different foundation. So we're not uh, yeah. using the same protocols. We don't think there's ever going to be a possibility of somebody teleporting from Arcadia to OpenSeam without effectively running, running two different programs underneath. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll also ask quickly about well, one, Bacadia, because uh, I know this was the case with High Fidelity. Um, I don't know how much we would consider this to be part of a you know template, but um, earlier on we had uh, uh, Fred Fredericks, oh, I can never pronounce his name, uh, speaking about Outworld, and um, I have an installation, you know, like twenty five regions, and they run on my own local computer, not the one I'm talking on now. In fact, just a spare one. Uh, but it means the server with all my assets in OpenSIM and my avatar and everything else is on my own computer and it travels out with me. And essential stuff travels out pretty fast across the hypergrid. Other stuff is a bit slow and some stuff I can never get when I'm out on the hypergrid. But the idea that my world and the interface of my world, as it were, is on my own system, it's like being in my room. And in the real world, I go out my door when I want to go somewhere. So to me, having my OpenSIM installation on my own computer is very much the same thing in cyberspace terms. I just go to, well, portal actually or something, to go to the location I want to go to, do what I want, pick stuff up maybe, and then return um, home into my own computer and then log out from there. Um, it also reduces a lot of stress on the server that I might be visiting because I'm, I, I visit there as a presence, but I don't necessarily bring all my assets with me. I only really bring the essential stuff. So um, I, I, I think I think that is still the case with your uh, platform, Dale, isn't it? That the user basically has a kind of offline starting point, and then they move into the the online component. Or have I got this wrong completely? Or have I just confused things no end? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay, well, but, uh, but I'll also ask, uh, I, I mean, e this is not um, a question for Evo or um, uh, Adam's own platform, but both, both Evo and Adam, if you've got any comments, do you think that is an important part of maybe generating a sort of part of the infrastructure by which, um, you know, a, a, a mass market of people could um, enter a metaverse, whatever you call it, for example, could could the Windows desktop or the Mac desktop actually be the portal you move outward from? Absolutely. The, the web-based experiences are yeah. one of the easiest ways to scale to the globe, because if you look at the number of VR headsets out there, it's not going to be right. It's going to be through browsers. It's, it's going to be yeah. through other mechanisms, not just through VR. And um, if you're thinking about what is the easiest, most portable and lightweight way to do that right now, we, we look at, you know, there's a number of WebXR based uh, experiences that are being tied together. For example, art galleries that work across more than one platform and, and have built uh, agreements around beginning to move from one platform to the next. Now, those are very early stage sort of alpha level experiments, not even beta yet, right? So uh, this is early stage stuff, I would say, and for most of us, uh, most of the folks working on the web-based uh, sort of portability and trans uh, and traversal between worlds are uh, maybe not aware of what has happened here for the last 12, 15 years now, right? I mean, this, this particular code base is one right place for experimentation for doing some of this as well. And I think uh, there are ways in which we could bring our communities together to do more interesting interop experiments down the line. Um, there's definitely some things happening between closed, uh, closed communities and, and sort of open web-based communities right now and agreements are being made. I think it's gonna happen partially through federated you know, small to medium-sized communities uh, taking on sort of a, a, a an anti-meta or a, or a different meta narrative approach. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach these these spaces, and I think we're going to see lots of fun iterations in the next year to come. 
Yeah, it's a bit of a be all and of, of everything, really, isn't it? I mean, that's why the attempted definitions of the metaverse is being well, everything. <laughs> you know, everything that isn't in the organic universe is the metaverse. Um, it, interesting. I mean, um, another another thing I'm wondering about, and it but would particularly relate to smaller and medium sized concerns and open sim, is whether uh, I'm. Um, Maybe we can we can best perceive uh, the metaverse or the cyberspace um, from the small bits piled on top of each other, rather than the big overwhelming thing that's trying to you know suck things into it. In other words, you know, a Skype call could technically be you could say, well, that's part of the metaverse because you could be having it in a virtual world, or you could be having it in your desktop, or you could be having it on the web. And it is a form of communication, but it's a, a form of communication that is by and large audio and video only. It doesn't include avatars. But, you know, many, many spaces that people meet and, um, even, you know, this, you know, we've got the clubhouses and uh, what is it, Twitter spaces and we've got things popping up everywhere that are constantly running audio conversations, basically, but probably as good as this, you know. Um, are those little things, and for, for example, an independent asset server or something like that, do you think maybe we should be looking at that kind of system? I mean, I remember Bruce Joy from Vastpark many years ago started an open avatar system. Uh, it uh, didn't get very far, but basically his idea was like a marketplace. You know, they would host an avatar for you. They'd host assets, but... You did, they didn't give a world to use them in. They were simply the server that hosted things on your mm -hmm. behalf that you could take with you, if you see what right. I mean. Right, and, and Ready Player Me is doing some level of that right okay. now. I think we're absolutely going to see uh, VRM, for example, become a much more uh, open, uh, not, not quite a standard, but uh, adopted by many of us. Certainly, it's already been adopted in Asia and, and becoming more so when you're looking at avatar portability, um, you know, we're experimenting right now in a couple of different ways. I think there's no real great single marketplace right now for open avatar yeah. experimentation, but Ready Player Me is definitely serving part of that. Space. Yeah, for those who don't know, Ready Player Me, uh, they, they allow you to take a photograph of your face on the web and they make an avatar for you. But more importantly, when you log into their site, they've got, it's like a destination guide for everywhere you can go and take that avatar. You know, all sorts of different companies, different worlds, you know, you just uh, you effectively teleport with your Ready Player Me avatar to wherever they, you know, uh, right. it's acceptable. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, uh, yeah, that just building on decentralized identifiers and these sort of open, uh, it, that's not necessarily a marketplace, but it's becoming one very quickly. So I, I think we will see lots of marketplaces growing over the next uh, yeah. cycle. Now, Dale, Dale also mentioned that he, he couldn't see any way that, say, OpenSim here, <coughs> where we're sitting, as it were, would, be, would <coughs> easily operate with something like Vicadia, even though both of them are, of course, open source. But <coughs> pardon me, cough, cough. Um, I have often imagined, um, I'm getting far too old to build these things or even try, but I've often imagined, say, building a studio. Um, maybe, um, or getting a built in Unity or Unreal or something like that, and modeling it in such a way that I can put a duplicate of it in multiple worlds of my choice. <clears throat> but I'd hopefully have the same avatar in, in each as well. But more importantly, uh, the, the idea I sort of had was whether it would be possible to put scripts and things like that in the build, embedded in the build that would independently talk um, to other instances of itself, for example, even if that self was on a different platform. The container, you know, like a, an object on the web, would be embeddable all over the darn place, but inside the container would be the mechanisms for communication with other instances of itself or just, or just back-end things. Now, how does attractive does that sound? I'll put this one to Adam first because you've probably got Probably a better grip on what I'm talking about there. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned this because I think uh, just uh, last week I volunteered to um, <laughs> to run the um, the um, WASM, which is the WebAssembly 
uh, oh, scripting great. working group for OMI. Um, I think that it's possible to do. There's some limitations here, and I, I think that we need to also be aware of that. Until we have got a standard system that everyone is using, and I think that's very, very important, actually. I don't think we should be work focusing on a on a technology layer that is um, broken into lots of tiny little pieces and fragmented, and there's, there's a reason for that. I'll come back to that in a second if you're interested. Yeah. But in terms of, of scripting itself, um, the problem is that sometimes platforms have got different capabilities and different feature sets. Sometimes they've got different ways they're accessed. Sometimes, for instance, they're focused entirely on VR headsets, whereas other ones may be focused on, say, a, a mobile touchscreen device. And then you've got lots of problems like how do you interact with these things? Uh, is there a requirement for having hand movement simulated, for example? So there is some some lots of question marks here about sort of how well these things would work if interrupt, interoperated, but it is absolutely something I think at least the groundwork could be laid. And that's something I, I'm looking forward to um, sort of championing over the, the coming coming year or so, um, particularly with that, uh, that working group and others. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm kind of thinking here. Uh, well, uh, on the level of scripts, at least we're not really interoperable with OpenSIM in that we use JavaScript. So yeah, that's not exactly LSL. Uh, it's not .NET either. But uh, yeah, there's certainly uh, opportunities for lower kind of uh, kinds of interoperability. Even you, if you can't, for instance, te teleport right uh, from one world to the other. Uh, some things certainly could could be done. You could uh, do things like streaming video. Uh, you could interact, uh, transmit chat data via scripts. Certainly, uh, we've uh, got, uh, for instance, uh, support for web surfaces. So you can embed just a web page anywhere inside the world. So that's uh, one option to can interpret. You know, can I interrupt? Yeah. Can you embed? Um, can you embed a web surface on an avatar itself? Never tried, actually. No, uh, tried it. Yeah, I know. I don't it, think it, so. I'll, I'll anyway, that's uh, yeah. So they said, yeah. Okay. I can say that does work in science space. <laughs> yeah, well, back in back in the days, uh, so I'll just interrupt you briefly here if I can, Dale. Back in the days of, I guess it was, um, it was Second Life, you know, you, um, avatars used to appear and they were white with the words missing all over them because <laughs> they couldn't find any of the kit. Uh, but people, you know, I used to have a t-shirt in Second Life and uh, maybe a jumpsuit or something as well, where I could, um, I could put media on the prim, on the prim that was the costume or, or, or the body. And it suddenly occurred to me, I don't know whether they really tried doing this, but, you know, all the future talk is about, you know, away from avatars and more towards holograms. If you had an avatar that was plain, obviously it had not have some motion sensor in it and whatever for gestures, um, where the actual skin of the avatar was somehow mapped from, you know, this is not home computing stuff at the moment, but like 360 cameras could pick up like the way they pick up 3D, you know, video shots, and they could map that texture to the avatar. So, to all the extents and purposes, it would your avatar would look like a hologram. Um, oh. But do you get what I'm getting at? So I rather fancy that. Mm. Uh, I actually just got a message, and people are uh, watching the the stream. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can actually yes, indeed, uh, put a web surface in an avatar. I never tried myself, but. Yeah, so you know, sometimes these little things can be yeah. <laughs> quite but, disruptive when they get going. Yeah. But, but yeah, I actually had another kind of interoperability um, suggestion in mind. Yeah. So one of, one of the strengths of our architecture is that uh, uh, the scripting can control pretty much everything. So you can create virtual avatars with scripting very easily. So for instance, yeah, uh, one uh, kind of way of uh, having some sort of interoperability could be uh, transmitting data about an avatar from one side to the other. Like uh, you could reproduce movement and have kind of an avatar and an avatar basically in the, in, the other, in the other place. I'm not sure how well that would work in practice, but something like that would be definitely possible. Uh, incidentally, for those of you who don't particularly know me, uh, this avatar I'm wearing here 
is identical to my avatar in Science Space and Breakthrough. It's identical to my avatar in um, Vicada, I believe, and Tivoli. Um, and in fact, I think, and here, I think actually Sansa is the only platform I really use now that doesn't support this avatar. So, you know, there's some comfort in knowing that I'm going to look the same wherever you find me. Mal? Yeah. What was your workflow? Did you use, what did you use as your base? Did you start in Ready Player Me? Oh, the avatar. No, this particular avatar, well, to be honest, um, I don't know whether it's in the audience, um, but uh, there's a chap here at Abacon who did it for me. Um, we used, uh, uh, what we, we did it jointly. We, we went into, it was a piece of Adobe software, I forget what it was called. And, you know, he, he asked me what I wanted. And I said, well, a bit of red hair, a bit of beard there, a leather jacket, because all these, these, none of these are wearables. It's all part of the overall mesh. And uh, when we got it about right, we sort of exported it and um, brought it into OpenSim. And then I managed to upload that into Science Space. And um, yeah, then I uploaded it into High Fidelity when Philips High Fidelity, when it was a world. And um, then when High Fidelity went away, I think I managed to find it by default in uh, Sunday. It was either in Vicadia or Tivoli or both. So, you know, I begin to get familiar with it, you know, and um, it's uh, because it's a single mesh. I mean, there are limits. I can't sort of put on uh, open sim clothing on top of this or where well, well, I could, but it looks stupid, you know. But I keep wondering, well, what could I put in this mesh? You know, the mesh is like a, an outline framework with its texture and everything else. But um, there's something I had in second life years ago called the brain. And you had, you know, you, you bought it or whatever, and you wore it. <laughs> but you, it it was worn on the inside of your stomach somewhere, and it allowed anybody coming to your virtual house to find out where on the grid you were by showing you on a map, because the brain was reporting your position anywhere on the grid, and it did other things too. Um, you know, so it's a good example of you know, I'm wearing this invisible thing inside my mesh body that is doing all sorts of. Uh, surveillance on me, I guess, is the word. <laughs> but, um, right, uh, let's get back a bit more focused on track here then. So, um, yeah, inter interop. Um, I, bef uh, um, Evo, you know probably as much as I do. Um, there was on our, um, on the, uh, there was, if I can get the, uh, the window I need open here. Is it called Red Eagle? Uh, um, it's on our army group there. He's oh, from... Yeah. Sorry? Do you know who I mean? I do, I do. We have... Uh, so within OMI, we have hundreds, almost a thousand active people in the Discord now, including yeah. uh, platform holders, people who work for uh, game, game uh, platforms and companies, uh, people who work on the association layer or on the standards layer, as well yeah. as uh, sort of every layer of the stack. So, um, yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm referring here quickly to um, back, in fact, to um, uh, here, Red Eagle PI, I think the avatar is called. Uh, he would have been here, actually, he's super interested in what we're doing. But um, if you, you've only got to look at his server, and um, there's, uh, I think they came more from gaming than virtual worlds, but uh, they've got so many meetings and chats going on that, you know, you couldn't get here because one was finishing and another was starting <laughs> all on their own server. But what I liked, uh, <clears throat> they're called OCEM, and I wish, um, I'm trying to see if I can, uh, uh, not easy. Uh, but the main, the, the interest, here we are, right, they, they, they stands for the Organization for, for Cooperation on an ethical metaverse. And this is one of the subjects I want to bring up, even though he's not actually here, is, you know, the, um, it's very easy to look at these big corporations moving into things now and realizing that, you know, how, you know, um, meta, you know, is, uh, they're at war with the European Union, they're at war with the British government now. <laughs> They've got the, um, Trade Commission people in the States looking into them. They're, they're, but, you know, I wonder how on earth they get away with it. 
And um, I think it's Grady Booch who has the same tweet posted every day saying that uh, Facebook is a profoundly unethical organization and it all starts at the top. <laughs> he just, that's a standard daily tweet on a headline. Um, if we're going to build open source and stand to be something that can stand up to these big corporations, in, I'm talking in a more philosophical sense here now, how important is we? is it that we kind of build a kind of ethical foundation to all this where we can actually maybe take the high ground and say to the likes of Zuckerberg, you know, <laughs> we're, you know, we're in the right place. So, okay, take it in turn, folks. So let's start with Adam on this. This is a really interesting and slightly dangerous topic, actually, to be honest. Yeah. yeah because well. there's a, there's an unspoken question of whose ethics are you going to be using here? Um, yeah. Now, I think that, that, that it's fair to say that um, harvesting everyone's data and selling it to the highest bidder is not going to fall into the boundary of, of ethical for, for most people. But I think it is something that to be very careful of. My ideal model for governance is always looking at the, the older internet governance. That is that sort of, uh, even, even still used today, but that sort of period that was, uh, that, that architecture that was mapped out in the, the 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, in particular, that sort of divided the, the network up and basically gave everyone control of their own space. There were some basic rules for playing nice with each other when you connect to the larger environment, but generally speaking, it tried to stay out of these questions as much as possible. And I think that that's the right model today because it always gives you the, the freedom to not use someone's product, not use someone's service and move to a different environment entirely. For instance, yeah. if you don't like Facebook or Twitter, you can use something like Mastodon, which is open source and relatively, yeah. um, relatively, uh, sort of a grassroots if you will yeah and i think yeah, that that model is the thing to follow um, when it comes down to this thing this is the second question you asked which was um sort of how how do you make sure that 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 succeeds versus the, the one platform dictated by the one company and yeah. the answer to that one is that you've got some you've got some tailwinds here anyway um, a lot of companies learnt um, some lessons particularly during the the mobile software era which we've just gone through that it's really dangerous having one or two companies in charge of the entire ecosystem. Um, with mobile, we've got that duopoly of Apple and Android, and you can easily see how the platform operators abuse their positions. Um, some abuse it more than others. Uh, I won't name names, but uh, it's pretty obvious you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. And there is a lot of tech companies who have had to fight with them um, over the last couple of years and have gotten very, very wary of, of signing up to being uh, just a participant in someone else's walled garden. Yeah. So I think that the, when it comes down to the metaverse, you're going to find that big companies are actually quite willing to latch on to open standards if it means that they're going to be able to compete fairly on their own without having to deal with platform operators. Uh, and and if the standards they're adopting work, which of course yeah. is a, ma a major part of it. Yeah, I noticed, for example, both Nike and uh, Reebok have joined the so-called N-word and, you know, um, but they've both chosen to do it, not to start their own platform, but to do it via, I don't know, Fortnite or something like that, you know. So you, you are, you're already getting this sort of corporate move in via a platform that's already there, as opposed to, you know, people like um, uh, Meta creating their own. Right. Um, uh, did you have any thoughts on that particular topic quickly, Dale? We are running short on time here. Uh, well, so in in that regard, uh, I think we, we have to quickly explain uh, the differences here. Uh, Vercadia is very radically decentralized in its nature. Like uh, we don't have a grid as such. Uh, we don't have an asset server. We don't have even a centralized account system. Uh, basically, uh, we don't have an account server, but its user, usage is completely optional. Yeah. Uh, and all the regions are pretty much like independent web servers, like they exist inside the internet, but they are actually bound to each other. We don't even yeah. have uh, crossing from one region to another. You, you can teleport, but there's no sim borders like like in open sea. Yeah, there's no, there's not that flat world thing where you can walk for hours. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah like, so, so that's oh, yeah, some, yeah. yeah, in some uh, uh, regards, that's a disadvantage. Uh, but in the regard of uh, making it uh, uh, safer for uh, various different kinds of communities uh, coexisting, I think it's a bit of an advantage. Uh, we, for instance, have no ability whatsoever to ban you from all of 
what is Vercadia? Like we could ban uh, people from our own uh, uh, kind of uh, organization uh, yeah, regions. Sure. Uh, I can ban you from our step, basically, yeah, from our de development meetings. But uh, absolutely nothing stops you from taking our code, setting up a, a server, and talking to whoever you want to talk, including pe people who show up at our meetings. Right. So th that's, that's basically like... it's an imitation of the web, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a bit you, like you, it's a bit like the self-hosted uh, OpenSim instance I mentioned. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, kind of like that, like that. In some regards, yeah. it's a disadvantage in that we have uh, difficulty hosting content. Uh, okay. But yeah, but we right. do think it's going to have an advantage in organizational. Uh, Okay. okay. Right. Well, I need to start wrapping. Um, Evo, did you have any uh, thoughts on the the the, the I Most of them in the chat, just uh, on the uh, oh yeah half of the conversation, recommending the work of si dot org. Um, yeah. Obviously, Ken Ken Bai's work, and then um, thinking about uh, protocols as well as standards. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of interesting research to be done here. Um, there's one of our colleagues at OMI, uh, Dr. Kim Nevelstein, has published uh, his doctorate on IPSME, which is a protocols-based approach. Um, and, and he's getting interesting results, for example, working between Minecraft and other worlds. Um, so there's some very interesting research. This is a, a right field for uh, discovery right now. And uh, it is. I think it's about what you're going to work on, as, as all of you here are uh, getting excited for your own research yeah. and labs. You're right. It is. It is an exciting time, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, for somebody me is going all over the place all the while. You know, suddenly stumbling on things and think, "Oh, great! This is happening," even in the face of you know, uh, corporate takeovers and stuff like that. So, um, in these uh, metaverse experiences, are so vast. And like, yeah, there are whole solar systems that might be meta created or Oculus driven that I'm never going to go see, and that's. Yeah. Hey, because not everything has to be interoperable for it to be connected and potentially yeah. available to everyone. Well, I, and I, I have to see that we have it available. And it's it's also really vast. accessible it, for everyone. Yeah, even something as small as uh, Second Life uh, is vast because you uh, no one person can walk the terrain of Second Life in a lifetime. Right. Right, and it's, I, I, it's I bring every square foot kind of thing. You know, it is it's huge. You can jump to where you want to go, so no problem. But you couldn't walk it, you know. Anyway, I'm going to have to cut you guys off because I've got about two minutes to wrap, and I did want to put make um, put out um, some pointers here. I'm just actually got my Discord open. Firstly, uh, just to, a bit of a it's a plug, but it's a open source project really. Discord servers are wonderful things. Basically, uh, it was built for gaming, but it works just as well for virtual worlds. I can even see. You know, um, I don't know, Sansa will have a channel, um, a server on Discord. Their users can talk together, but ultimately, at the end of the day, maybe people could, will be able to jump from Discord to some kind of URL that would take them to a location in Sansa, and the same with Vicada or anything else. That's down the line. But there are so many of these servers around, and they don't all just belong to platforms. Um, obviously, um, We've talked about OMI, which um, has a server. The OCEM, this is the ethical metaverse people, they have one. And uh, one minute to wrap. Yes, I know, I know, I know. Panic, panic. Uh, reacting to the background here. Oh, yeah. And there's um, another um, server, um, which I haven't had time to ask anybody about here today, um, called the Open 3D Foundation. And they, they have a Discord yeah. server. Yeah. And they're colleagues and friends of ours. We, we are really just. Uh, fantastic collaborators yeah. <laughs> all over the world. And so uh, yeah. we just want to invite you to be a part of that ongoing collaboration. The questions you are asking in the chat here are fantastic. And they yeah. are exactly the questions we need to be asking around if, decentralized if, identifiers, if, around metadata, around privacy, and around how we work together uh, to do this. Yeah. Okay, okay. If you can put it in chat for me, I'm terrible at reading chat while I'm actually broadcasting. So I, I can tell I've missed a whole load streaming by here. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for attending and hope we've been useful in what we've been talking about and everything. As I said, this is sort of a bit of a two part thing. I'm going to be here at the same time tomorrow. Uh, God, maybe one of these two would drop in. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I'll be with, uh, I'll be hosting one with Dusan Reiter and Dr. Fran Babcock. 
And um, the focus of that one be looking towards the future from a more global sense. Today's been more about the open source code and, um, you know, the basics. Um, but, um, you know, where we're going generally is going to be more the sort of thing I talk with um, Fran and uh, Dusan Writer about. So uh, I hope you can attend that one too. And hope you've enjoyed this one. And, well, bye for now. Uh, thank, uh, thank you to all of you, Evo, Dale, and Fran, <laughs> Adam. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me here.